electric or EV industry or this automotive industry is not only about engineers. It's also about people who come in from the BCom, uh, from the commerce uh, backgrounds. It's also people who come in from arts backgrounds. It's people who come in with creative backgrounds. So it's a full automotive sector. So look at a sector which is of your interest. If e-mobility is of interest to you, then look at within the e-mobility, which are the areas that you would really like to focus on because everything is going to grow. So if you have, if you're a chemistry student and if you chemistry has been your important, uh, has been your passion all your life, then look at batteries, lithium ion batteries, what's happening in that space. Hi everyone, I'm Pratham. I'm uh, one of the project directors at the Masters Union. Um, today, I'm really excited to welcome uh, Naveen Munjal, uh, one of the foremost authorities on uh, electric vehicles in India. Uh, he's of course the managing director of uh, Hero Electric, which uh, I believe he started back in uh, 2007, if I'm not wrong. And uh, of course, Hero Electric is one of the pioneers of uh, electric vehicles in India. And I'm so excited to learn more about his company, the industry, and also what he thinks about the talent market um, in the electric vehicle segment. Naveen, I just wanted to, you know, first start with your story. Um, how did you get into this industry? Uh, what your experience has been and, and, and you know would love to learn more about the company as well that you've been running So I actually started electric mobility here in India way back in 2000 2001 And the reason for that was I was trying to bridge a gap between a person who's using a bicycle make life easier for him And then be able to graduate up to a motorcycle or a scooter The scooter category was dying out at that time motorcycles was becoming more prevalent And so was the moped category. So we used to have the 50 cc mopeds earlier 50 or the 80 cc mopeds, which was dying out, and now motorcycles and scooters had really taken over. So, for a common man who was using this uh, mobility as a means of transport, going from place A to place B, and going from a, on a bicycle, which was at about 1500 odd rupees or so, and then the next vehicle up was about 45,000 rupees. That was way too much of a jump. So, we thought that yeah. if we could introduce a product in the range of 15 to 20,000 rupees, that'll bridge the gap for him, make life easier for him. And then he moves up the value chain. So we introduced electric bicycle at that time. Uh, didn't work quite well. The technology wasn't advanced enough. It was a lead acid battery, so a heavy battery on the back of a bicycle. The balance center of gravity is up. Not a great product. Uh, went back to the drawing board, came back again in 2004. And then in 2007, really introduced the electric scooter. That's when I realized the classic mistake that I'd been making as well, which was that a because the consumer, majority of the places, they are aspirational. So they want to graduate from a bicycle to a scooter, to a motorcycle, to a car, and then upwards in the journey. Uh, movement from bicycle to electric bicycle is not really an upward movement for him. It's an expensive, more expensive product, and it doesn't give him the level of uh, satisfaction or the level of uh, 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 recognition in the, neighbor, in the community that a scooter would give him. So realize the classic mistake, uh, electric scooter market began to take off in India in a very large way. In 2009, there was a whole number of players who had jumped into this space. And that's when we formed the Electric Vehicle Association as well, SMEB, Society of Manufacturers of Electric Vehicles, the only EV association in India and continues to be the only EV association in India. And I was made the president of it at that point of time and I still continue to be the president uh, today. I guess nobody wants to wear that hat. I was of a firm believer that this industry is actually going to work electric. Mm. We have to move away from a polluting oil-based industry. Even at that point of time, we were importing about 70% of our fuel, of our oil. And so we had to get away from that. Mm. But uh, we believe that this, we've come reach a stage now where we are very well entrenched. Majority of our, we have a dealer network in excess of 500 dealers across the country exclusive. Mm -hmm. I've got a team which has been there with me for a long time, which understands electric and not just understands, but they're, they're passionate about this industry and about the sector. And you can't possibly sustain a business or you can't possibly remain in a business through all those ups and downs unless you're really passionate about it, unless you really believe in it. So the point being that you have to stick. If you believe that this is something which is going to work in the long run, you have to stick. We've stuck through all of this. We've grown. We are being seen globally as a very serious player. And we continue to push. And uh, it's begun to, we are at the cusp of that whole explosion, which is going to happen in India as well. And we are there right at the right moment to be able to take advantage of it. But there is a lot of history behind. There's a lot of hard work behind, which has got us to the stage. Sure. That makes sense. So, I mean, this is an anecdotal question, but uh, when will India get its Tesla done? 
So when you look at electric mobility, you have to actually break it up into different baskets. You cannot look at electric mobility in one genre. You, it's not one genre, it's not one basket. Even though the need may be similar, the fuel, but it's like comparing, you know, so you could separate the two wheelers versus three wheelers versus four wheelers and public transport. And all have different needs and different wants. And all have different reasons why that sector would take off or not take off. The infrastructure requirement, for example, for a two wheeler is very different to that of a car. Mm. And of a three wheeler is very different to that of a public transport bus, mm. even though they are both commercial products. Now, whenever you look at uh, electric mobility versus IC engine, at this point, simply because of the cost of the battery, your vehicle itself, in terms of performance, if they're equal, your vehicle will be more expensive, uh, electric vehicle. Though your cost of running would be much cheaper than that of an IC engine, but the initial purchase price would be higher. Hmm. So when you look at cars, for example, in India, the average purchase price overall of the whole auto industry, which is about 2 million units, is very low hmm. because people are using them as taxis or people are buying the cheaper products, the 5 lakh, 6 lakh, 7 lakh cars. Now to convert that consumer from a 5 or 6 lakhs to say that, you know, buy electric and that's going to cost you 10 lakhs or 15 lakhs or 12 lakhs is very different. It's mm. very, very difficult. But the minute you go into the luxury sector, and this is my belief, and this is not, the industry may not agree with me on this, but mm -hmm. the minute you go into the luxury sector, and when you're targeting a consumer who's buying the ultra luxury cars of one crore and above, there, I think conversion would be much easier. That's right. that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. So when do you think in India, in a country like India, we'll start seeing an upsurge uh, in adoption of electric vehicles. Uh, and, you know, I would want to give you one year as an estimate where we'll have more electric vehicles than IC vehicles. Um, that year is actually a little far off. So we estimate, and there is numerous global estimations, that by 22, 23, the price of lithium would have come down to an extent where it'll, there's going to be some parity between the performance of IC engine versus electric. And that's where the momentum would pick up. Okay. When we looked at our own calculations of uh, when is that day going to be when electric mobility is uh, sold this thing, and we said no matter what you know, the projections are, what, whatever be the governmental projections, etc., does it make sense for us to remain in this industry, even if electric is only 30% of the industry in the next 10 years, by 2030? And it still makes sense. It still makes ample sense. That would be at a much faster pace than what IC Engine had done in the past. So disruption is inevitable. So no matter which way you look at it, are you a believer in this industry? You could say that, you know, 30 is too conservative. It is conservative. But the good side is that we've got an upswing there. Hmm. How this shift is going to begin happening now. So if you look at it at this point of time, we are in a COVID lockdown position. We are at a time when vehicles have been largely off the road in the last uh, maybe about seven odd weeks now. How much the climate has changed? Hmm. So if you look at the air quality has improved dramatically. Dramatically. Mm -hmm. Weather has changed dramatically. Hmm. People are breathing much fresher air. We are getting much less issues of respiratory issues, uh, respiratory problems that we used to get earlier. India has been notorious for bad air quality. Hmm. And there is a Harvard report and there is numerous reports which go out to which claim that uh, people who have more, who've been affected by PM 2.5 are more prone to deaths with something like a COVID-19, simply hmm. because your lungs have taken a beating all their, all their lives. Hmm. And if you look at even our lungs, there are, I mean, generally people have black patches and simply because it's not because you're a smoker, but right. it's because of the air that we breathe all the time. Mm -hmm. I think what's possibly going to happen now is that people are going to look at electric and clean air in a much more serious manner than what they were earlier. And so uh, I want to also compare India with China for a second, because I believe China uh, has taken up to electric vehicles in a much more welcoming and quicker way. Uh, so what's happening in China? Mm -hmm. China electric mobility took off because of uh, the government push that had been uh, that they gave. So it wasn't just about creating the infrastructure. It wasn't just about incentivizing electric mobility. It was also restricting IC engine from coming into cities. Mm -hmm. A number of cities actually banned IC engine vehicles or two wheelers to be sold. Even now, in a number of cities, if you want to buy an IC engine car, you have to actually explain why you want IC engine car. Mm -hmm. you may have to 
buy a license to be able to buy a IC in Jakarta oh, yeah. or Tokyo. Mm-hmm. So what they did in China, we may not be able to do here from a standpoint of the government push. Uh, mm-hmm. Restrictions may not uh, come into play here. What may happen and what is already happening is, for example, BS6 coming in, Bharat norms, the emission norms will make IC engine vehicles more expensive right. to run and to service sure. substantially more than what they were earlier. Mm-hmm. For a consumer, it's going to become more expensive to own the vehicle. Fuel is going to become more expensive. Servicing is going to become more expensive. And you've got electric on the other hand where the battery price is dropping. It's going down. Performance. Yeah. So there is going to be a cross curve which is going to happen. So we are sitting in a very good position at this point where mm-hmm. electric, once people start adopting it and people start using it, we see it in our case as well. We have about 44%, uh, approximate 44% people who have already bought our vehicles and are buying them again or are getting referrals or getting people in uh, to buy our vehicles. So there's a very large referral that happens here because people have understood the ease of using these vehicles, the convenience of using. It does their bit, its bit for the environment. And on top of that, it saves it's a, uh, it saves fees. Uh, it saves money. Right, right. So, uh, you know, uh, one, one thing that I've been thinking about quite a bit is, you know, and we spoke about this previously as well, uh, which is what are the ancillary industries? So, of course, uh, Hero Electric, uh, you know, will do well. But what other industries uh, will sort of follow your coattails, will grow with you, uh, will supply into your infrastructure? Uh, what does that entire ecosystem look like to you? So, part of that ecosystem a uh, substantial part of it, actually, I would say, is the current ecosystem which is already there for an IC engine vehicle. So the majority of the components that you require are similar. So you still require your chassis and your sheet metals and your plastics and your headlamps and your shock absorbers and tires and wheels and, you know, the wire harnesses, etc. Hmm. The differentiation is only in the battery pack, the motor, the controller, the BMS and all of those things. Mm-hmm. So that is where the whole change lies. And that is where we don't really have an ecosystem at this point of time. Mm-hmm. So one is the vehicle, what goes onto the vehicle itself. So that whole ecosystem is going to be created here for manufacturing. So we need motor manufacturers to step in. And there already are a number of companies who are stepping in. We need battery manufacturing to happen here. Right now, it's more battery assembly. So we are importing the cells from outside and just assembling them, which is very low value addition. But we need that to improve and we need that to increase. We need the whole telematics, whole data management. Because in electric, there is a lot more data that's being generated. There's a lot more data that's being captured by the vehicle in terms of the electronics than which was there, what was there in the IC engine. So every moment for every second, you're capturing thousands of data points on how the vehicle's performing, etc. And that's data storage is going to be an uh, going to be a very important factor. Smart connectivity of the vehicle is going to be a very important factor, which was never there in the two-wheeler sector or in the IC mm-hmm. engine. So now your vehicles are controlled from your smartphone, or at least there's some communication between your smartphone and your vehicles. Then you've got all your e-commerce deliveries, etc., who are now using old vehicles. They could suddenly now start using electric mobility. Mm-hmm. So e-mobility, electric vehicle, electrification happening will create a lot of ancillary, new ancillary units which didn't exist earlier. There is a myth about job losses, etc. because of E coming in and IC going out, etc. So, uh, you know, in terms of talent now, if I'm a student who's going to be graduating this year or next year, and I'm interested in the electric vehicle industry, what's your advice to me? What should I be doing? What kind of skill set should I be building? What kind of job should I be applying to? Uh, and how can I get a job in the electric vehicle industry? Electric or EV industry or this automotive industry is not only about engineers. It's also about people who come in from the BCom, uh, from the commerce uh, backgrounds. It's also people who come in from arts backgrounds. It's people who come in with creative backgrounds. So it's a full automotive sector. So look at a sector which is of your interest. If e-mobility is of interest to you, then look at within the e-mobility, which are the areas that you would really like to focus on because everything is going to grow. So if you have, if you're a chemistry student and if you chemistry has been your important, uh, has been your passion all your life, then look at batteries, lithium ion batteries, what's happening in that space. Be able to foresee what is going to happen. And that is going to happen by attending these webinars, etc., by seminars. 
physically, it's not going to be possible to attend these seminars. And I think it's better to even attend the webinars because you're sitting at home and attending so many more than what you could possibly do and hearing the best possible speakers on the planet coming on uh, online to talk about it. Take courses online. You've got various platforms where you can actually just take a short course to understand what's happening in that space as current as possible. So looking at, at this point of time, we're going to need people from all walks of life. We're going to need people mm -hmm. to handle help us with the marketing, digital mm -hmm. marketing is going to become a very important factor. How you sell vehicle, mm -hmm. how you service vehicles. Mm -hmm. Now, physical service to an extent is still going to be there, but there is remote service as well, which is going to have a very important play. AI is going to be very, is going to be a very important factor going forward. AI is going to be extremely prevalent. And if you have that bent of mind, then I would strongly suggest getting into these, some of these areas, uh, which didn't exist earlier. And where the older generation, we don't really understand it to that extent. AI is going to play a very, very important role. Autonomous driving, like it or not, is going to come in. It may take longer in a country like India, but will certainly come in in yeah. India as well. Mm -hmm. Got it. Understood. And so uh, one last thing, you know, which is about uh, the MBAs, you know, a lot of the people who will be watching this are students who want to pursue their MBA. Uh, so how do you think about business graduates, right? Uh, do you hire them? What do you look for in a business um, a graduate? And, and, you know, what are the roles uh, that, that they can uh, expect within the business side? Yeah. No, we certainly hire business graduates. In fact, I'm a business graduate. I'm not an engineer at all. Mm -hmm. Even at times I do think like an engineer. I think maybe I should, I, that maybe I should have done <laughs> engineering as well. But uh, I'm a business graduate and I do understand technology to an extent. So yes, we hire business graduates for sure. In a sector like ours, there is no precedence. So when you look at, so there is no real precedence on what is, how do you really get there? You know, some of the traditional sectors, you have some companies who've done that in the past. So you can follow that pattern and you would get some level of success or failure depending on how you've done. But you know what is the path, so mm -hmm. to speak. In the, where we are coming from, electric mobility, there is no precedence. There is no real path which is already chalked out. Mm -hmm. So what is there? We know that where we want to get. Now, how do we really get there? So there is a lot of analysis that we do and there's a lot of brainstorming that we do. A lot of times, some of the innovation, innovative ideas that we've implemented haven't really come from us uh, sitting in, you know, at the mm -hmm. senior management teams. They've come from people who've just come out of business schools or engineering schools or different things, who are completely fresh and their mind is not completely uh, bogged down or at least right. you know, full up of ideas that we've already implemented and not succeeded. So mm -hmm. if you're coming in from even a business school, there are numerous areas for you to work in. Come in with a fresh mind, absorb what's happening. So when you come in, come in with fresh ideas, mm -hmm. but also right. understand what's really going on and then try and see how those can be fitted in. Right. Makes, makes a lot of sense. So uh, thanks. Thanks so much, Naveen. I think this was really interesting, really exciting. Uh, I'm sure, um, you know, uh, the students who are looking at EV industry as a, as a prospective career path, uh, you know, would find this very helpful. Um, for me, I, I think one of the new things that I've learned is that the job opportunities are beyond just engineering. I think what you mentioned, that's also a myth in the industry, uh, you know, that somehow, uh, you know, the jobs are only going to be in engineering and uh, those also will get wiped out. So I think, I think those are very important myths to be uh, clarified. And, and thanks so much for doing that. We are all uh, really excited to, you know, see you in the classroom also in the fall. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're currently working with you to obviously, uh, make the course, but I'm super excited to see you in the classroom. I think students will benefit a lot from it. Um, so any, any thoughts about, you know, practitioners teaching, uh, or the way master's union is structured, any, do you have any observations on that? I love it. I mean, I would love to go back into my MBA <laughs> with head of a faculty. So it's a brilliant idea. And this is, uh, this is what is actually required, you know, for students. Uh, because what you need is not just theory, but also practical. And I would love to talk about, you know, not just the successes that we've got, but the failures, right. the things that we did wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to make similar mistakes, but it's at least you know that, you know, somewhere and someone there made that mistake and how they were able to get out of it or how they were able to correct it. And maybe the cost of getting out of it or correction for you 
maybe slightly lower than what it was for us. Mm -hmm. So I think it's extremely important for people to understand the practicalities of business. And that's not just from theory. This is also from practice. So it's a very good curriculum. I like what I see. And I'm very, very excited to be a part of it. So I'm really looking forward, even though I've not taught in the past, but I'm really looking forward to how do I really impart all that knowledge that I've built up. So I've been doing a bit of mentoring in the past, but that is more one-on-one. -on -one. And mentoring is very different from teaching. So, but and teaching is very, very different from going and talking in a seminar or a workshop because there, you know, technically, I mean, you could say anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you have a responsibility towards responsibility. the students you have to impart knowledge and not just knowledge on how do you really utilize that knowledge. Excellent. So I'm extremely excited with it. I think it's a brilliant platform and I wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Naveen. Thank you so much for that and, and really appreciate your time uh, this Sunday morning. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>